Now, in the last lesson, we left Noah drunk and naked in his tent. Now, these events, right after the flood, have perplexed scholars, both Jewish scholars and Christian scholars, for years and years. The question is, why tell about Noah in these situations, planting a vineyard, then getting drunk, and lying naked in his tent after the amazing account of God's flood and coming against the evil in the world. Here in this section, we're going to find that Noah died 350 years after the flood, so we're assuming we're getting close to that. But this is the only event, the only account of planting a vineyard, getting drunk, and lying naked in his tent. Now, in Lesson 22, we propose the solution of God telling us about no planting a vineyard. Uh, this seems to be related to the Hebrews coming out of Egypt. They had assimilated into the culture, and in their assimilation into the culture, the Egyptian gods were connected, very well connected, to planting vineyards and to making of wine. So in actuality, it seems as if what God is doing is a polemic. He is using vineyards that were common in Egypt. The Hebrews are just coming out of Egypt. They're reading this for the first time. They're the initial audience. And God is coming against the gods of Egypt who actually planted vineyards. No, here's Noah. He planted vineyards. It's the first vineyard that's planted, recorded in the Bible. So maybe it has that purpose. It's probably not the first vineyard anybody planted, but it could very well be that God has placed it there as the first vineyard so that it comes against the concept of the Egyptian gods planting the first vineyard. But now what about Noah being drunk and naked? This event seems to su suggest that something big happened. I mean, imagine, you've got the flood, huge event, and now this. Something big must be going on, but the question is what? We'll focus in on that and we'll explore it. Also in this lesson, we're going to be focusing on Nimrod. And when we take a look at Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 12, plus 11, verses 1 through 9, and you read it very carefully, you check various other translations, and you really ask yourself, what does the Torah say? What does the Torah not say? So, when we look at the Bible, the Torah, in these verses, nowhere, Nowhere does it say that Nimrod was the founder of pagan religions. Nowhere does it say that Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. There's absolutely no historical proof, none whatsoever, to claim that Nimrod was the founder of pagan religions and built the Tower of Babel. <laughs> but why is it taught? Where does this come from? Well, let's go see. And we're going to remember the words of Adonenu Yeshua, our Lord Jesus. This is in John 8, 31 through 32, when he says, If you're a disciple of mine, you will abide in my word. You will be a disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the Greek word there, back to the Hebrew, is amad, means to stand. To stand on, to rely on to base your life upon, to endure life in his word. In this way, we will know the truth, and this is what we're attempting to do. So indeed, let's follow our rabbi. Let's follow our rabbi Jesus when he says to stand on his word so that we would know the truth. Come, let's go study.
in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, we might get some ideas of possibly what's happening in the ancient Near Eastern culture. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, Woe to you who make your neighbors drunk, who mix in, in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. Oh, now we've got drunkenness and nakedness at the same time. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now, yourselves, now you yourselves drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. What's interesting is that verse, here's another one, Lamentations 4.21. You can read that one, but you're going to also talk about uh, drunkenness uh, and nakedness. It seems as if what we may be dealing with is Noah got drunk, went into his tent. Why he took his all clothes off, I, I, I don't know, but <laughs> he's drunk. So how do you explain what drunks do? I mean, you know, I mean, they do a lot of crazy things. So this guy takes his, all his clothes off, and he's sleeping it off in his tent. The implication here is, in Habakkuk and in Lamentations, that he has put himself in a shameful situation. Now, nobody knows it because he's in his tent. Are you with me? He's in a shameful situation. He got drunk, and he's naked in his tent. Now, what happened? But Ham, Ham, comes along and he saw his father's nakedness. Now the question we have to ask here is, so what's the big deal? What did he do? Because later on what you do is that Noah, Noah actually curses Hanan, the entire nation. What happened? So if I go to the JPS Torah commentary, and we take a look at the story, this is very interesting. The earliest, now I want you to understand, because there's two words in here you need to be very clear on. The earliest post-biblical traditions. That's after the Bible's written? So who is that? Rabbis, okay? That's what that means. The earliest post-biblical traditions take this verse literally, and the final clause of the verse would seem to support it. Ham compounded his lack of modesty and filial respect by leaving his father uncovered and by shamelessly brooding about it what he had seen. In other words, his father was in a shameful situation, and what does he do? He sees it, and then he tells his brothers. In other words, look what our dad did. I'm going to disgrace him in front of you, okay? So Noah does a shameful thing. He's covered. He's in his tent. Ham sees it, tells his brothers. He now he disgraced his father because his father has been drunken in a shameful situation. On the other hand, the verbs of verse 24 and the severity of Noah's reaction suggest that the Torah, now listen to this. Scholars say that the Torah has suppressed the sordid details of the rest of the story. In other words, they're thinking that there's more to this story that's actually not being written about, and it's actually hidden because it's that awful. Rabbinic sources are divided on whether Ham castrated his father or committed sodomy. Wow. The former interpretation might be supported by the fact that Noah has no children after the flood. What? You go more into the JPS Torah commentary and you read also that the rabbis are just scratching their heads on this and they're just figuring, what the heck is going on? Now Shem and Yafet, they covered their dad's nakedness, walking backwards. They don't want to see their dad in a shameful situation. We know Noah wakes, he sees this, he curses Canaan the descendants of Ham. So again, we come back to the issue that Noah lives 350 years after the flood, and all we have is this story. Now, this is Torah. Okay, th there's a purpose here. Remember, 
when you are taking a look, when you actually do, or I'll take this, remind, uh, remind ourselves of what exegesis is. Exegesis is trying to find the original intent of the author and what the first hearers heard. And one of the most important points is when you're trying to find the meaning of text in the Bible is what's the point? So once you find the meaning, what's the point? And now we're struggling with the meaning. What did Ham do? There's still difficulty here. Okay? So there may be people with different opinions and so on. But again, scholars have struggled with this. Now, Torah is instruction. It's not law. God is trying to teach us something. But what is he trying to teach us? Now, it could very well be that those people thousands of years ago in the ancient Near East understood everything that was going on here. And we didn't. It could be, this, is a, this document's 3,000 years old, okay? This is not modern English, okay? This has got nothing to do with the 21st century. So we have that difficulty. Now, again, I'm going to thank Dennis Prager in his lessons because he really shared about the struggle on this, and he said he struggled with this as he was trying to teach it. And they are the puzzling aspects of this entire story. What's God trying to get at? What's the purpose here? Now, Dennis Prager uses some really awesome Jewish scholars. One of them is Leon Kass, K-A-S-S. -S. He is a great Jewish scholar. He is alive today, matter of fact. He wrote a commentary on Genesis, and it's called The Beginning of Wisdom. And Dennis Prager had said, when he looked at Cass's commentary on this story, he says, I think this guy's got something. I, he said, I'm not trying to say, and neither am I trying to say, that what Cass is suggesting, and we're going to take a look at this, is what it is. But he said, I wonder, I wonder, and this guy is a great Jewish philosopher, thinker, and writer. Leon Cass says, Ham saw his father's shame. And what does he do? He tells his brothers. Now what that means is this. Noah was in a shameful situation. Any of you, if you saw me drunk, and Robin said, yeah, John is drunk. He's in the camper naked lying on the floor. I don't think any of you, okay, no matter how much money they paid you, would want to see that sight. <laughs> I'm in a shameful situation. <coughs> Did I sin? <coughs> well, some people say if you drink, you sin. I don't want to go there. But anyway, I'm in a shameful situation. But what Ham does, he tells his brothers, and he disgraces his father. Now, Cass said it could be just that simple. Maybe it's not castration. Maybe it's not sodomy. Maybe it's not, he said, because he disgraced his father. Now Noah wakes up, and he learns about what Ham did. Now that probably means that Shem and Japheth, Japheth, okay, probably told their dad. So understanding what just happened, it seems, and this is what Cass will come up with, Cass said, Noah talking to Ham, you destroyed me as a father? I will now curse your children. And I will come against you as a father. Because at that time, the assumption might be, on Cass's part, that Ham did not have children yet. Again, that's Cass's view, all right? And we're not trying to say that's his view. We're not trying to say this is it. But he has something here. Because Noah's in a shameful situation. Ham basically makes it worse by disgracing his father. So the dad shamed himself. And so the thing is, we don't want to disgrace him. You don't want to expose him. Ham should have seen that and said, oh my goodness, I should have covered dad. He's in a shameful situation. I want to release him from his shame and just leave it as that. And maybe he said, brothers, uh, we'll talk about this later. Okay? That would have been an honor to his dad. And we know we're supposed to honor our mother and our father. So is it the fact, and this is Cass's point, is he 
trying to make a statement for all mankind. Stop now. This is interesting. The first 11 chapters have got nothing to do with the Jews. The first 11 chapters are about mankind. And you know and I know that the foundation of any society is the family. If the family is destroyed, so is your civilization. We know that. And as God saying to us, through all mankind, you understand the importance of the family and especially the authority of the Father. It's interesting. It could be that God is teaching us the critical nature, the critical nature of fatherhood. And that's Cass's point. And Dennis Prager says, huh, oh, that's interesting. He never looked at it that way before. Could Cass have something? We don't know. Because the questions are still there. Are you with me? Who was saved in the flood? A family. In the pagan accounts, it's the gods and the hero and friends. Gods are saved. Okay? Here, it's a family. A family is saved to start society all over. The foundation of society, the family. Interesting. And the Torah, I won't do this right now because we're going to see this over and over and over again over these years. The Torah always emphasizes the family. The family is central to the Torah. Now look at the Big Ten. The Big Ten. The first statements that come out of God's mouth. Okay? What's one of them? Honor your father and your mother. Whoa. This is huge. This is the giving of the laws. This is how you're supposed to live. By the way, it doesn't say love your mom and dad. It doesn't say like your mother and father. You don't have to like them. You can disagree with them. You may not love them, but you have to honor them. That's the word used, and the Hebrew word, you're going to love this. Let me give you the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for honor is kavod. Kavod means heavy. Matter of fact, kavod is the Hebrew word used for God's glory. When you say, oh, God's glory is kavod. God is awesome. He is heavy in a good positive sense. And that's why a number of you people notice that I wear a Jewish kippah. Yarmuluk in Yiddish. I'm not Jewish. And the reason why I wear this is the significance of this for a Jewish man is to say, I'm under the authority of God. I answer to him, and by goodness, the stuff that I teach, may it give honor and glory to him, and may you be blessed to walk in a deeper and most dramatic and loving way with Yeshua. So that's why I wear it. I'm in awe of him, and I'm in awe of what I'm doing. And I fear him. I do not want to in any way disgrace my father by teaching. Well, I did teach my opinion, right? On Revelation 21.1. That's my opinion, okay? I just wanted to burden you the way I'm burdened with the thing. That's all I wanted to do. But we'll continue here. So we have to kavod our mother and father. Now, when you actually get into a good dictionary, like Asenius, it means to honor, to make them great, to lift them up, to make them huge. In other words, could it be this entire story is about the preservation of the family and the respect of parents? Because ladies and gentlemen, that's the foundation of civilization. Did you hear what I just said? God is trying to teach us in the Torah, possibly from Cass's point of view, that civilization depends upon the family. So we end off with that section. And for me, do I agree with uh, Dennis Prager? Um, and do I agree with Leon Cass? Um, no, because, well, it's no in this sense. I'm like you when I'm listening to Leon Cass, and I'm like you listening to me. I'm listening to Leon Cass, and he makes a point. Very interesting. Is it possible? It's possible. The Torah doesn't say it. That's possible. I respect Dennis Prager's opinion. His opinion is, boy, this makes sense. Is it the answer? No, it's not. 
But we know for one sure, God loves the family. And honor your father and your mother. Okay? It's almost like Leon Cass did the same thing in his opinion with what I did with Revelation 21.1. Same thing. Just a view. Okay? But I did want to share some of those things with you that are uh, obviously quite clear in terms of the culture. Let's go to Genesis 11, verse 1 through 9. Genesis 11, verse 1 through 9, and again I'm reading from the Fox translation. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, Now all the earth was of one language and one set of words, and it was when they migrated to the east that they found the valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said each man to his neighbor, Come now, let us bake bricks and let us burn them. Let's burn them well burnt. So for them, burnt uh, brick stone was like building stone, and raw bitumen was for them like red mortar. And they said, Come now, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, its top to the heavens, and let us make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. But Yahweh came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. Yahweh said, Here they are, one people, with one language for them all, and this is merely the first of their doings. Now there will be no barrier for them in all that they scheme to do. Come now, let us go down there and let us baffle their language, so that no man will understand the language of his neighbor. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of all the earth, and they had to stop building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, Babel. For there Yahweh baffled the language of all the earth folk, and from there Yahweh scattered them over all the face of the earth. Now the first thing I want to do is when we take a look at this, and we take a look at these people, I want to go to Genesis 10, verses 8 through 12. In Genesis 10, 8 through 12, we read, Cush begot Nimrod. He was the first mighty man on earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Therefore, the saying is, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Yahweh. His kingdom at the beginning was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalin in the land of Shinar. From this land, Ashur went forth and built Nineveh along with the city squares and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is a great city. So with regards to that translation, I also want to go into the New American Standard for the exact same one. So again, I'm going to be in chapter 10. In a New American Standard, we read uh, in chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod, became a mighty man on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. At the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Ir and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is a great city. So that's a little bit more clear from the Fox's translation. Now, one of the things that I have heard, and maybe you have heard, is that Nimrod, okay, built the Tower of Babel. I don't know if you've heard that before, but I've been taught that. There is no historical basis anywhere that Nimrod had anything to do with the story in chapter 11. Nothing. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, there's some real significant statements. I want to read that to you. Again, commentary from Genesis 10, 8 through 12 from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Interpreters over the years have attempted to identify Nimrod with known historical figures. With Tukul T. Neruta, an Assyrian king during the period of the biblical judges, or with Mesopotamian deities such as Nenurta, a warrior god and patron of the hunt, who in one myth hunts down a number of fantastic creatures and defeats or kills them. In Genesis, however, Nimrod is clearly a human hero rather than a divine or even semi-divine. Now, here's the phrase. Listen. Late Jewish tradition, picked up occasionally by the church fathers. Uh-oh, here we go. It's the Jews and the Gentiles. It's the church and Judaism. Okay? Envisioned him as the builder of the Tower of Babel. 
and the originator of idolatry. But these ideas have no basis in the text. None. So I went to Jewish sources more on this. I went to the Encyclopedia Judaica, fantastic resource, and they talked about Nimrod, and they said basically the same thing, and they said the first time that you hear about Nimrod building the Tower of Babel is in the Agadah. Okay, there are two, uh, you might say, major uh, works in Judaism, okay, the Halakha and the Agadah. The Halakha is basically the way you're going to walk. It's, it's the rules, it's the regulations, it's, it's some things that are very, very specific, okay? It's the, uh, the application of the Torah. The Agadah <laughs> is Jewish legends. This is a Jewish source. This is the Encyclopedia Judaica. The Agadah is Jewish legends. They're stories. They're made up, okay? And this is after the biblical period. So the Bible is already done. Um, Louis Ginsburg, a Jewish uh, writer and scholar, he wrote two volumes, of which I have them, okay, called The Legends of the Jews. So from the Agadah, he tells you <laughs> the legends about Nimrod. You wouldn't believe this guy, what he's done. These are all stories made up by the rabbis, all of them. Now what's fascinating to me is I have heard this in the church, me, and one of the things, I was so disconnected from the origins or the original sources of where this stuff came from. I didn't know, okay? I put two and two together. I'm reading this stuff in English. And I just saw this and said, Nimrod must have been the tower. No, absolutely no. There's no connection whatsoever. Then I was in the Messianic congregations. Oh, my goodness. And I unknowingly started believing this because... People were teaching rabbinic midrash as truth. And, oh my gosh. And I love the rabbis. I love the story of the oil on Hanukkah because I know its purpose. I know the purpose of the midrash. They're trying to make a point. They're teaching. They're like parables, but they're not. Okay? Jesus taught in parables. None of the stories were true. None of them. He's telling a story to make a point. It's like a midrash. The Good Samaritan story is a story. Now you need to understand what he's doing with the story. So this is a good spot to re-emphasize the approach to this Torah study. Light of Menorah is putting the Bible into its historical context. I'm a Bible historian, I'm not a theologian. Thus, when we take a look at it, those people who had first access to the writings of Moses, to the Torah, what did they hear? What did they see? What did they understand then? And so as a result, we can deepen our understanding and enhance our faith. Now, Nimrod is a case in point. There are many legends about Nimrod, and they're, and they're actually fun to take a look at. In the JPS Torah commentary, of which you have heard me mention it many times, they say many of the explanations of who Nimrod is comes from late tradition, late Jewish tradition. Late Jewish tradition means rabbinic view, rabbinic views, rabbinic opinions that come many years after the Hebrew scriptures have been completed. So, for instance, Legends about Nimrod come from the Haggadah. The Haggadah basically are stories written probably around the late century, late second century AD. But too many today teach rabbinic opinion as truth. I've been in a number of messianic congregations and they're wonderful. Christian Gentile teachers and my experience over all of these years is that and I know these guys have a heart for the Lord and a heart for the gospel but they're talking they're talking and they're teaching the Torah 
and they're actually using rabbinic opinion or rabbinic views as the truth. Now, Leida Menorah, I, I don't dismiss rabbinic opinion. But I actually understand what it is. It's just opinion. It's a view. And I have to treat it as such. In some cases, rabbinic opinion, rabbinic views, help us maybe grasp a little bit more about what's going on. <laughs> In the case of Nimrod, it does not. It's like rabbinic opinion... This was, uh, I believe, 2nd century A.D. Maybe it's in the Haggadah. I don't know, but I know this. You know that there is this uh, story about Hanukkah where there was only one bottle of oil left for the menorah. And they used the oil, and it lasted seven days. The oil which should have only have lasted one day, and that was the miracle of the Hanukkah. No, it's not. That was a rabbinic story that has no basis in historical fact. That's not the miracle of Hanukkah. That's just another example. Now, in the next podcast, in Lesson 24, we're also going to be studying the Tower of Babylon. And here we go again. We're going to focus in uh, again on the Bible in its contest, and we're going to ask again, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible not say? But once again, we're going to be faced with late rabbinic opinion and we're also going to be faced with christian views that are truly fantasies and bordering on mythology the, one thing that you need to do is pick up children's bible story books on the tower of babel compare that to what it says in the bible it, it's almost like christians are creating a mythology around the tower of babel as disciples, we can't do that. We can't teach opinion and legends as truth. I think especially to children. Many of you probably listening to this lesson probably say, I don't teach anything about Santa Claus, so I might bring it up. We talk about the truth. As they grow up, they dismiss Santa Claus. As they grow up, they dismiss the Great Pumpkin or whatever. Well, they do that with God's word as well because we keep on changing the Bible into mythology and children's stories. So we must truly stand on God's word, just like he said in John 8, 31 through 32. We need to rely on it, stand upon it, create our life to be a foundation on it, not just stories or opinions, but the truth. We must guard it from silly conjecture. And we must immerse ourselves in his word so that we will know the truth and we will know the truth to be free and we'll remember in luke 24 50 that jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the father just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands it could very well be that jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to Aaron to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkeinu Yair Adonai Panava Aleinu Vekunekeinu Isa Adonai Panav Aleinu V'yasem Lanu Shalom B'Shem Yeshua Adonainu Amen So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make His face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon us and may He give us His Shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.